Welcome back to our channel, where we explore fascinating stories and characters from the Bible. Today, we're diving into something chilling, the seven most evil people in the Bible. Who were these dark and infamous individuals? What terrible deeds did they do to become some of the most wicked figures in history? From Herodias, the cunning queen of Galilee, to the infamous Cain, whose actions reverberated through generations. What pushed them to commit such awful acts? Join us on a journey through the chilling tales of betrayal, murder and deceit that shaped the lives of these sinister characters. Discover the lessons hidden within their dark legacies. Are you ready to uncover the secrets of the darkest souls in biblical history? Stay tuned as we reveal the stories of the seven most evil people in the Bible. Let's get started. Number 1. Nimrod Nimrod is a legendary biblical figure in the book of Genesis and Chronicles. This occurred after Noah's time. He is a descendant of Cush, who ruled over the land of Shinar. Nimrod eventually became the father of two of the Bibles and world history's greatest empires, Assyria and Babylon. He was the first world civilization's great leader. Regrettably, he also led the world astray from God. First, what does the name Nimrod mean? It comes from the Hebrew verb marad, meaning rebel. Nimrod is mentioned three times in the Bible. Genesis 10 is the first and most detailed passage. Cush was Nimrod's father, who grew to be a strong and skilled warrior. He was known as a great hunter in the eyes of the Lord. This is why people say, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. His kingdom initially thrived in Babylon, Eresh, Akkad, and Karne in Shemenah. Nimrod is later mentioned in a genealogy in 1 Chronicles. According to the book of Micah, even centuries later, Assyria was still associated with Nimrod's legacy, especially among the faithful. Many believe Babel and Babylon are the same. The city Nimrod is credited with establishing in Genesis chapter 10, verse 10. Some Bible translations list this city as Babel rather than Babylon. Genesis chapter 10 verse 10, the beginning of his kingdom was Babel and Eresh and Akkad and Kalne in the land of Shinar in Babylonia. Long ago people aimed to build a tower that would reach the heavens, daring to challenge God. Their goal was to gain fame. The tower they envisioned resembled a ziggurat, a tall brick building with winding staircases. These towers often displayed astrological signs at their summits. Although the purpose wasn't star worship but a display of human power and greatness. God was deeply upset by the Tower of Babel. He said that if he let them continue, there was no telling where it would end. So God gave tongues for the first time to confuse the people. They could no longer understand each other. From then on, humanity split, scattering and speaking different languages. There is an interesting footnote to the story of Babel. The people at Babylon, Babel declared independence not from another nation, but from God himself. Their words were, let's build a city and a tower that reaches the heavens. Let's make a name for ourselves. The city symbolized civilization, while the tower represented a religious structure. Both endeavors focused on humanity rather than God, reflecting a form of humanism. Number two, Jezebel. Queen of Israel. In the Old Testament, Jezebel was the wife of King Ahab, the ruler of Israel at that time. Ahab not only strayed into idol worship following Jeroboam, but also married Jezebel, the daughter of the Sidonian king, adding to his reputation as a wicked king. The Book of Kings portrays Ahab as the most evil among all kings, causing much devastation during his 22-year reign. Jezebel used Ahab to further her evil schemes, and he readily complied. Their marriage marked the first time an Israelite king had married a pagan princess. Jezebel, a worshipper of Baal, replaced the worship of God with the cult of Baal, spreading this practice throughout Israel and even into Judah. Baal, depicted in sculptures with a helmet bearing bull horns symbolizing strength and fertility, held a club for thunder and a spear with leaves for lightning and vegetation. Jezebel influenced Ahab to adopt Baal worship after their marriage. 
driven by her thirst for power and ruthless suppression of dissent. She disregarded all moral constraints, showing fervor in her devotion to pagan rites. Jezebel worked tirelessly to maintain idolatry in both kingdoms, greatly harming Israel and Judah. The tragic account of Jezebel and Ahab's demise unfolds in 1 Kings chapter 21, set in their palace in Jezreel. Beside, the palace stood Naboth the Jezreelite's vineyard. Ahab desired the vineyard for a garden, but Naboth refused to sell because Israel's law mandated ancestral land be retained within families. Jezebel, noting Ahab's discontent over Naboth's refusal, assured him the vineyard would soon be his. Using deceit, she orchestrated Naboth's death to secure the vineyard for Ahab, ensuring his sons wouldn't inherit. Jezebel's calculated and wicked schemes were as relentless as they were evil. Elijah confronted Ahab en route to claim the vineyard, prophesying Ahab's demise, the gruesome fate awaiting Jezebel in Jezreel, and the dishonor of Ahab's descendants. Jezebel's sins extended to the murder of God's prophets, with Obadiah hiding some to protect them. She also attempted to kill Elijah, who fled to Horeb for safety. A few years later, Ahab was slain in a battle against the Syrians, and Jezebel continued to rule for nearly another ten years after his death. Her death happened, according to prophecy prophesied. If you think Jezebel was the worst, let me introduce you to her daughter. Number 3. Athaliah, Queen of Judah, Athaliah, daughter of Ahab, the king of Israel, she got married to Jehoram, son of Jehoshaphat. She mirrored the wickedness of her mother, Queen Jezebel, her father, King Ahab, and her brothers, King Ahaziah and King Joram, by becoming a malevolent queen herself. Athaliah, whose name signifies afflicted by God, ruled as Queen of Judah from 841 to 835 BC, occupying King David's throne. Her husband, Jehoram, reigned as King of Judah, until his death in 841 BC. Jehoram, unlike his father, was a malevolent ruler. Following Jehoram's demise, Athaliah's son, Ahaziah, took the throne at the age of 22, proving to be just as wicked as his father. Athaliah played a hand in guiding her son in his nefarious endeavors. 2 Chronicles chapter 22, verse 3 he also walked in the ways of the house of Ahab, for his mother was his counselor to act wickedly. Athaliah, who had already lost her husband and then her son, took the kingdom for herself by executing her own grandchildren. Unbeknownst to Athaliah, a single grandchild escaped the massacre. Just like her mother, she worshipped the god known as Baal. Following Athaliah's six-year rule, the high priest Jehoiada stationed guards around the temple and ceremoniously crowned young Joash as the rightful king in a public display. As Joash received the anointing as the new king, the crowd erupted in applause, cheering, Long live the king! 2 Chronicles chapter 23, verses 12-13 to 13. When Athaliah heard the noise of the people running and praising the king, she went into the house of the Lord to the people. She looked and, behold, the king was standing by his pillar at the entrance, and the captains and the trumpeters were beside the king, and all the people of the land rejoiced and blew trumpets. The singers with their musical instruments leading the praise. Then Athaliah tore her clothes and said, Conspiracy, conspiracy. Queen Athaliah entered the temple to investigate the jubilant sounds, encountering a child she believed dead wearing a royal crown, her young rival Joash. What shook her further was the unwavering support the people showed him. Her accusations of treason fell on deaf ears as the people stood firmly behind Joash, recognizing her as the true usurper. Jehoiada commanded her execution, carried out not within the temple, but at the horse gate, where she met her end for her crimes in Judah. Number 4. The Antichrist Let's delve into a significant aspect of Satan's domain central to our spiritual battles, the spirit of the Antichrist. This... Opposition, as I term it, differs from the singular figure known as the Antichrist and also from the numerous Antichrists who have emerged over time. The 
Teachings of John primarily elaborate on this spirit and these individuals. To clarify, the term Antichrist originates from the Greek Christos, mirroring the Hebrew Mashiach for Messiah. Therefore, Antichrist essentially means anti-Messiah. The prefix anti in Greek holds two significant meanings, both relevant to the concept of the Antichrist. Firstly, it signifies being against something, in this case, against the Messiah. Secondly, it implies substitution or taking the place of. The ultimate aim is to supplant the true Messiah with a false one. Further in John's teaching we read, By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God, and every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming, and now it is already in the world. 1 John chapter 4 verses 2 to 3 This is the last manifestation, the final product of the spirit of the Antichrist at the end of this age. Scripture makes clear there will be one last, most evil, most powerful ruler who will rule mankind for a short time, who will be the Antichrist. The third form is the spirit of the Antichrist. The spirit of the Antichrist is the spirit that works through every Antichrist. The closer we get to the end of the age, the more the spirit of the Antichrist will intensify, and the more we will find ourselves engaging it in battle. John has given us four distinctive signs of the spirit of the Antichrist. These are of great importance. First and foremost, this spirit gets its start in association with God's people. The second mark of this spirit is that it denies that Jesus is the Messiah. As we see in 1 John chapter 2, verse 22, Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? And then John continues with the third mark, he is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Keep this in mind. The spirit of the Antichrist doesn't outright deny God's existence. In fact, the Antichrist will assert to represent God. What this spirit rejects is the relationship between the Father and the Son within the Divine Trinity. The fourth characteristic of this spirit, outlined in 1 John chapter 4, is its denial of the Messiah's coming. It likely believes in a future Messiah, but denies the past arrival of the Messiah, known as the Antichrist. The ultimate form of the Antichrist spirit will materialize as the Antichrist. Let's explore some scriptural passages to unveil Satan's schemes. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, Paul discusses the emergence, revelation, and appearance of the Antichrist, intricately linked to preparations for the Lord's return. These events are interconnected because the Antichrist's unveiling will precede the Lord's return. Paul indicates that the Antichrist will be vanquished by the radiance of the Lord's arrival. This being is referred to by three names, the Antichrist, the man of lawlessness, and the son of perdition, with another significant name revealed in Revelation 13. This is part of the vision that John had. The fourth title is the beast, a person who is going to arise to whom Satan, the dragon, would impart his power. Why will Satan give his power to that person? Because this will enable that person to gain dominion over the entire human race and convince all mankind to do the one thing Satan most desires, to worship him. That's his goal. He's been working patiently on it for many centuries, and he's very close to his achievement. God's installed ruler does not have the nature of the beast. He has the nature of the Lamb, and he is exalted above all others because he gave his life. He has humbled himself, and he has walked in the way of meekness and humility because he did not resist his arrests and persecutors. I believe that the church must show the same nature these days. In Revelation chapter 13 verses 6 to 7, we see the Antichrist take action. And he opened his mouth in blasphemies against God, to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle, that is, those who dwell in heaven. It was also given to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority was given to him over every tribe, people, language, and nation. He is the open challenger of God. He is not a secret enemy. He shakes his fist in the face of Almighty God. Number 5. Manasseh 
Throughout history, we have encountered numerous malevolent figures, but today, I want to focus on a particularly sinister character from 2 Chronicles chapter 33, Manasseh. In my view, he surpasses many notorious leaders in his wickedness and cruelty. He was the son of Hezekiah, but when it was time for Hezekiah to die, he cried, O oh God, don't let me die. Please, O oh Lord, spare my life. And the Lord did. So the Lord spared him for fifteen years. That is the question. Do some people live too long? And a few years later, during those fifteen years, Manasseh was born, who would go on to become one of the most wicked of all the kings. The author of the Book of Kings introduces each king and evaluates their reign based on a few criteria. Did they worship only the God of Israel? Or did they promote the worship of other gods? How did they deal with idolatry among the people? Did they remain faithful to the covenant, like David? Or did they become corrupt and unjust? On these fronts, Manasseh was unsuccessful. At the age of twelve, Manasseh became king, and he set out to destroy all of his father's accomplishments. He was a very wicked man. According to the Bible, he was involved in some of Israel's or Judah's worst idolatry. Second Chronicles chapter 30 verses 1 to 6 Manasseh was 12 years old when he became king and he reigned in Jerusalem 55 years he did evil in the eyes of the Lord following the detestable practices of the nations the Lord had driven out before the Israelites he rebuilt the high places his father Hezekiah had demolished he also erected altars to the Baals and made Asherah poles he bowed down to all the starry hosts and worshipped them. He built altars in the temple of the Lord, of which the Lord had said, My name will remain in Jerusalem forever. In both courts of the temple of the Lord, he built altars to all the starry hosts. He sacrificed his children in the fire in the valley of Ben-Hinnom, practiced divination and witchcraft, sought omens and consulted mediums and spiritists. He did much evil in the eyes of the Lord, arousing his anger. He installed gods everywhere, including in God's temple where people worshipped other gods. Men by nature, wrote Isaiah, maketh a god and worshippeth it. Man has to worship, he has to worship something, he needs to prioritize something, and if you reject the actual and living God, you'll have to create your own god. Then he was a murderer, and not just any murderer. Manasseh was a sadistic murderer. Furthermore, it is said that Manasseh spilled a great deal of innocent blood until he had filled Jerusalem from one end to the other. Some sources even claim that Manasseh assassinated a God-sent prophet. God had blotted out the sins of other nations, but he went beyond all of them. God's judgment fell, and Jerusalem was seized, and all the goods they had gathered, as well as all the money, silver and gold, were taken to Babylon. Manasseh was not put to death. Instead, he was taken to Babylon in shackles and imprisoned in a dark, damp dungeon where he was tormented by his conscience. He had plenty of time to think about his bad activities. Do you know what he did? He began to confess his sins. He prayed to God for forgiveness. Would you forgive him if you were God? Would you forgive a man who had done so much, who had made blood stream down the streets of Jerusalem as high as the horse's leg? He had sacrificed his own sons to one of the gods and had them burned. If you were God, would you forgive him, even if he pleaded for forgiveness? Many of us would be incapable of doing so. However, you have no idea who God is. We will never fully comprehend the depths of God's compassion, mercy and forgiveness. It's difficult for us to comprehend, but do you realize what God did? He was forgiven by God. When he was in trouble, he was in jail. He turned to God, whom he should have yielded to years ago, and led Judah in great revival, but he didn't do it. God, have mercy upon me, a sinner. Manasseh began to pray, and this great God of mercy, who is beyond our comprehension, answered him, and God's forgiveness is much greater than ours. It's what God refers to as justification. As though you'd never sinned before, you are treated as if you had never committed a single sin in God's eyes, and according to the Bible, He is incapable of remembering your transgressions. 
He wipes the tapes clean, all of them. He has no recollection of them. God forgave Manasseh, but do you know what he accomplished in addition to that? He restored him to his throne in Jerusalem, and he ascended to the throne once more. Can you believe it? Manasseh's material well-being had been restored, his sins were forgiven, and his heart was renewed. His life was flipped upside down. It was written that he knew the Lord, that he was God. God is saying, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit. He removed all of the strange gods and idols from the Lord's house. He fixed the Lord's altar and commanded his people to serve the Lord, God of Israel, by sacrificing their own peace offerings and thank offerings. He died and was buried in the Garden of Uzzah after a reign of 55 years, the longest in Judah's history. Number 6. Cain In the tale of Cain, the first murderer, we witness the gravest impact a person can have, taking another's life. This tragic event unfolds at the dawn of human existence. Adam and Eve, the first humans, conceived Cain. His birth mirrors the act of creation by the divine. Remarkably, humanity's initial homicide transpires within the second generation. Revealing a profound theological truth from Genesis 4, we are not sinners because we sin, rather, we sin because we are inherently sinful. This inherent sinfulness, stemming from Adam and Eve's transgression in Genesis 3, corrupts the human heart, leading to selfishness and perversion that culminate in acts of violence like murder. Genesis 4 contrasts sharply with the innocence depicted in Genesis 3, where Adam and Eve enjoyed unblemished intimacy with each other and with God. The narrative underscores the internal corruption that plagues humanity, a stark consequence of the original sin, echoing throughout generations. You might imagine that sin will progressively worsen with each new generation, the children of Adam and Eve telling tiny white lies, possibly minor thievery by the third generation, extortion and racketeering by the fifth generation, and eventually perhaps slaying. However, this turns out vastly different. This shows us that corruption knows no bounds. It does not appear gradually, as unnoticed degradation does. Because humanity had been completely perverted, it should come as no surprise that the initial sins were among the most heinous. Cain became enraged and sullen as a result of his wrongdoing and God's just reaction. Cain was probably envious, plain and simple. He didn't want his younger brother to outdo him. Cain's envy was most likely sparked by God's favor on Abel's sacrifice. Cain was angry and took out his rage on Abel. Yet the younger brother did nothing wrong. Cain could well be mad at the Lord for rejecting his contribution. He may be unhappy with himself for not choosing sacrifices that he knew God would accept. Sin is a growling beast that waits for us to relax, let down our guard, and forget to be vigilant. Sin is a cunning opportunist, waiting for us to be at our most vulnerable, so that it can devour us with the least amount of risk. Cain was eventually faced with his transgression by the Lord, but take note of his heartening. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is your brother Abel? I don't know, he replied. Am I my brother's keeper? The Lord said, What have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Genesis chapter 4 verses 9 to 10. A hidden sin on earth is a public scandal in heaven. Never ever forget that. God is fully aware of whatever we do on this earth. The blood of your brother is calling up to me. Cain's actions were known to God, but his heart was too hard to realize the enormity of his own heinous deed. Cain demonstrated his arrogance, complete lack of knowledge about God, lack of regret, and absolute scorn for Abel in just two phrases. God then delivered justice. Genesis chapter 4 verses 11 to 12 now you are under a curse and driven from the ground, which opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it will no longer yield its crops for you. You will be a restless wanderer on the earth. Cain's wickedness rendered crop production impossible, putting a stop to his livelihood. His poverty would force him to travel indefinitely. In response, we finally see some emotion from Cain. Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is more than I can bear. 
Today you are driving me from the land, and I will be hidden from your presence. I will be a restless wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. Genesis chapter 4 verses 13 to 14. All we know is that Cain's life was spared by God's favor. I wish stories like this one had a nicer ending. I hope we can end this story with a happy finish. As a result, Cain repented, accepted his grace, and lived the remainder of his days in humble and worshipful adoration. Unfortunately, that did not occur. Number 7. Herodias, Queen of Galilee. Herodias is known as an evil queen, and the fact that she was responsible for the execution of John the Baptist will ensure that she is never forgotten. She persuaded Herod Antipas to arrest John and throw him in jail, which Herod did as a result of her efforts. In point of fact, she had desired for John to be put to death. However, Herod Antipas was hesitant to carry out such a plan because he dreaded the reaction of the people, and also because he believed John to be a virtuous man. At one point, Herod celebrated his birthday by hosting a feast, and during the celebration, the daughter of Herodias came in, danced, and delighted both Herod and the guests who were with him. Herod made a rash promise, in the form of an oath, that he would grant her any request she might have. Mark, chapter 6, verses 17 to 28. For Herod himself had sent men, and had John arrested and bound in prison on account of Herodias, the wife of his brother Philip, because he had married her. For John had been saying to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias held a grudge against him and wanted to put him to death and could not do so, for Herod was afraid of John. He said to her, Whatever you ask of me, I will give it to you, up to half of my kingdom. And she went out and said to her mother, What shall I ask for? And she said, The head of John the Baptist. Immediately she came in a hurry to the king and asked, saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And although the king was very sorry because of his oaths and his dinner guests, he was unwilling to refuse her. Immediately, the king sent an executioner and commanded him to bring back his head, and he went and beheaded him in the prison and brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl, and the girl gave it to her mother. Thank you for joining us today, and we hope this video has been insightful and encouraging. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and share it with others who have similar interests. Also, leave a comment below sharing your thoughts and any other biblical topics you'd like us to explore in future videos. Until next time, may the hope of resurrection and the assurance of God's power over death bring you comfort and strength. God bless you.